So part of me really hates making this video. I am not, generally speaking, a negative person. Um, and <laughs> I really, uh, unfortunately, don't have a whole ton of good things to say right now. Um, so this is my review for The Dark Forest by Cixin Liu. Um, and to clarify, this is at a point now where I'm, I'm DNFing The Dark Forest. Um, I'm not enjoying it. I, I think at this point I'm in enough of a weird headspace about it that I'm not going to be able to focus on the story itself. And so I'm putting it down at least for right now until I've had a little bit of distance and I can come back and see if I'm enjoying the story more later. I, I went into this with some pretty high expectations. I really, really liked the three body problem, and I know everybody who's a Chinese reader who's been commenting on my video for the three body problem was saying the dark forest is even better. Um, and for me, it was an extremely difficult book to read. Um, so the book revolves around a couple of characters. Um, post three body problem. If you have not read the three body problem, I'll be a little bit spoilery here. Um, so you can go and watch that video on my review of that book instead if you don't want to see spoilers. Um, <laughs> the the Trisolarans are on their way to Earth. Uh, the estimated time that they're going to be there is uh, in about 400 years, um, 500 years, a couple centuries. And so Earth kind of goes into a panic and says we need to do something to, to start kind of preemptively building up our forces um, for when the Trisolarans actually come here. Uh, the first parts of the story, uh, the main character in this one is Luo Ji, and he is kind of a washed out ap academic. He's not really doing a whole lot of stuff for himself that's worthwhile, kind of just coasting. Um, and all of a sudden, the UN announces that they're going to be doing what they're calling the Wall Facer Project, um, which is basically giving obscene amounts of funding and very little oversight to four people who they're putting in charge of kind of coming up with plans to assist Earth in future years. Um, the, <laughs> the impetus behind this is that the Trisolarans have Sophons, which are basically spying on everything anyone says or writes or anything like that. So any kind of organized, um, organized approach to research or defense planning is very vulnerable. Um, Luoji is one of the people who selected to be a wall facer, and so he is kind of, <laughs> and he's kind of checked out. He doesn't really want to be a wall facer, he kind of just uses the position for his own game. Um, and of course then it jumps forward to about the halfway point when the Trisolarans are basically halfway to Earth. <sighs> like I said, this was a very hard book for me to read for a couple of reasons. I think first and foremost, the writing style is extremely hard to get into. Um, and I think that may be a combination of Sishin Liu having a really unique writing style. Um, and then on top of that, it's a, it's a writing style that maybe just doesn't face up well to translation, or maybe there's something with the translation that makes it less natural sounding um, when you're reading it in English. On top of that, the story switches perspectives a lot. Um, so there are a couple of different times, and it'll switch from one wall facer to another, or from one person to another, um, and it'll do so very rapidly. Um, so it'll be, you know, six, seven pages of one person, then six, seven pages of another, and then back and forth and back and forth. Um, and each of those characters is kind of dealing with a very different approach to the Trisolarans. So it, it can be really jarring. <laughs> it was, it was hard to kind of get into the flow of what Sishin Liu was trying to do. Um, the main character, Luo Ji, is really disengaging for me. Um, I kind of just 
one, I, I didn't think, think he was a very likable person. I know he's not really supposed to be. He's kind of self-interested and, like, irresponsible and definitely, like, not into this responsibility that he's supposed to have. And that's fine. I think I, I disliked him for a number of different reasons. Um, while it, I, you know, I don't find him likable on kind of a personal level, he also has this weird subplot in his storyline where basically he falls in love with a, a fictional character who he makes up and then kind of finds somebody who's exactly like that fictional woman he made up. It, it's really weird. Um, and for me, it was... Oh, I was not into it. It was like one of those moments where all I could say is like you couldn't accept somebody for who they were and so you went and made up your own person. Um, and that was <laughs> just a, a weird moment that I, I didn't really like and it's kind of echoed throughout the rest of the book um, when he's talking about how things change. Um, you know, he'll say something like, I'm so glad I can still see beauty in women or something like that. And it was just like, <laughs> the wall facer project itself, I found to be really, really weird. Um, really hard to, to believe that the international community would do it. Um, it's interesting because the translation has some notes about how the Wallfacer project is based on Confucian ideas. Um, and I'd be really, really interested for those of you who are among the Chinese audience to hear your thoughts about why this project makes sense. Um, I think from a, a Western perspective, it's really hard to get your head around the Wallfacer project. Um, like I said, it's basically where they said you four guys are now kind of in charge of this really introspective, singular, individual kind of planning system. We're not going to do any oversight. You have access to any information you want, any funds you want. I have a really hard time believing this, um, and part of it, part of it is just the nature of international relations. Um, I have my undergrad in political science and IR, and I'm really heavily involved in a couple of different MUN, Model UN um, programs. And so when international relations, when, when countries come together to agree to something and it's not something like, we all agree this is a problem, we're not gonna do anything about it, it's really hard for me to accept it. Um, and this is this is a personal pet peeve that I have with any story any storytelling that involves international politics. There are 192 countries in the United Nations. They basically never agree on anything. Um, <laughs> to get 192 nations to agree to something that's as kind of strange as the Wallfacer project to me is really it's really hard to suspend my disbelief for that. Um, on top of that, the United Nations, and this is again, totally a personal thing, totally like a weird hang up that I have. Um, when people use the United Nations as kind of the extension of a supranational government, and especially when they do that because of a military threat, right? So there's, there's aliens who are coming to attack Earth, and so they're like, the United Nations is the natural place for us to go. It makes no sense to me. Um, <laughs> so I, I think part of this is because of the very nature of the United Nations. Um, it, it's a, the United Nations is more or less a humanitarian endeavor. Um, it doesn't have any military infrastructure at all. Um, I think this is hard for people to understand because of the presence of UN peacekeepers in certain areas. Um, there are 19 conflict zones right now where the UN has, has feet on the ground. Um, they're blue helmet peacekeepers. And people think of peacekeepers as the UN's military. This is not at all the case. The UN has 
basically no experience dealing with serious military endeavors. Um, currently, it has one thousand, like just about a hundred thousand volunteer peacekeepers. These are people who, by and large, go onto the ground without guns, um, without the same kind of rigid military structures. Um, as an actual military endeavor. It's not the same as NATO um, or any other military alliance. In fact, like the, the entire the entire 19 <laughs> peacekeeping operations between them have less than 60 helicopters. I mean, there's no way that in a military crisis we're going to be going to the UN. Um, like I said, this is totally a pet peeve of mine and it's, it's one of those weird quirks of my own personal interests that makes it really hard for me to get into a story. Um, and so when Station Lu has the, the United Nations step in as the supranational government to take over kind of military operations and defend Earth and unite Earth, it, it's really hard for me to, to suspend my disbelief for that, more so when they're all getting behind a project that's as kind of non-traditional as the wall facer project um so i i had a big problem again suspending my disbelief for it overall i just the combination of kind of a stunted translation or stunted prose characters that weren't really working for me the switching back and forth between themes and plots kind of continuously and then these kind of, like I said, personal pet peeve, suspension of disbelief problems I was having made it really hard for me to read this book. And again, I'm really, really interested to hear from the Chinese readers from their perspective um, what parts of these characters were working for them. Um, for instance, there's a really big theme of corruption and kind of misuse of funds that I intellectually I find interesting and I had a hard time engaging with it but I I'm sure is it is an interesting theme in a, in a different context than that of the US um, and I'd really I'd really love to hear your input about what in this story was really a big draw from for you what you really really liked um, and what wasn't working for you you know, are, is it me being just totally out of context or are some of these things kind of struggles with this book in general? Um, I'd be really interested to hear about that. And I'd be interested to hear about if Station Lu's writing style is kind of unique among Chinese authors. Um, we don't get a lot of Chinese translations and I, I am trying to be better about reading those that are available, but I'd be really interested to hear if those, if the prose is unique in Chinese, um, or if this is a, a kind of strange translation problem that we're having in the U.S. edition. Um, let me know what you think if you have read The Three-Body Problem. I'm really, really, really interested in your thoughts. I cannot emphasize that enough. Um, <laughs> I hope you're having a fantastic reading week. I'll talk to you later. Bye.